Hello everyone. Today our presentation is titled Theories of Conflict and Peace or Theories of Peace and Conflict. Um, and our objective in this presentation is to discuss the various theories or um, perspectives you know to understanding conflict and peace. You know because um, it's important for us like we have said to understand all of these perspectives so that we know how best to approach conflict to approach peace and to basically resolve conflict you know when when they arise uh, now theories are said to constitute a part of the process for searching uh, for certain explanation about certain phenomenon certain subject matter you know how do we how do we explain um, certain occurrences how do we explain certain incidents certain conflict incidents you know um, theories help us in that regard now we have also said that peace and conflict involves an attempt to understand and explain the conditions of of peace right um, and um, those conditions include what is the nature you know of conflict what are the causes of conflict you know what are the dynamics of conflict all of these will eventually lead us to to peace if you understand these um, these dynamics the causes and we're able to resolve it as, as much as possible you know we can sustainably build peace um, that can last all right now in order to understand um, all of these we have mentioned in order to understand peace and conflict studies it's important to also have an understanding of theories relevant theories all right now what what are theories theories are a set of hypotheses that have been tested over time and have been proven to be true you know and of, of course upon these hypotheses these general assumptions um, we can make generali generalizations okay we can make generalizations from these um, from these tested hypotheses that have been proven over time to be to be correct we can generalize and say if this was correct or if this was uh, was believed to be true in this in this situation then of course it can also be true in this situation so that's 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 what theories are basically now there are certain elements that every theory must possess and um, four of those elements include um, assumptions you know concepts proponents and critique so every theory must have certain major assumptions major arguments you know that the theory is putting forward so we're saying that assumptions are statements that reflect the major arguments about a phenomenon of interest so it depends on what the what the subject matter uh, involved is you know what major arguments are, are you know are, are made by that theory so th those are those are what we refer to as assumptions if the theory can uh, can have two three major assumptions or arguments that it is making you know and then goes ahead to to try to provide evidences as to why those arguments you know should be should be accepted as valid or not you know and of course um, you you find we we'll see examples of major arguments um, assumptions or theories as we as we discuss some examples of those theories all right we say that they are foundations they are the foundation of the theory um, they provide the underlying structure upon which other elements are built so the major assumptions of a theory or the major arguments are very very central if you're talking about a theory and you don't understand the major arguments that theory is making then of course that theory cannot be useful for whatever analysis you know you're making the second element are concepts every theory has certain concepts that are unique to such a theory you know and concepts here we say they mean abstract words that represent or describe a concrete phenomenon you know if you take for instance the concept of power you know power itself is an abstract word if you don't attach a meaning to power i mean without the meaning we have attached to power as a concept you know um power is just an abstract word you know so so concepts are abstract words that represent so whenever you mention power as an abstract word there's a meaning attached to power and so that meaning comes to mind um, so basically power represents the meaning that is attached to power 
you know power is power is an abstract word that that represents a meaning you know um the ability to get people to do what they otherwise would not do you know and so on and so forth so concepts have certain or theories rather have certain concepts that are central to them you know and uh, some of the concepts uh, in peace and conflict or peace and conflict um, resolution include peace of course that's a concept um, conflict is a concept these are concepts that you will see um, very often in many of the theories that we're going to be discussing justice in the violence and so on and so forth all right the third element are the proponents or the theorists those who have um, who have who have argued you know um, this theory those who have uh, those who have um, promoted you know and who have expanded uh, the arguments of the particular theories that we're going to be talking about you know so the proponents are individuals who have expanded the arguments you know or who have argued um, further the 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 the, the, the assumptions that have been made in these theories all right and every theory has proponents you know every theory has proponents and so proponents are a very very important element of a theory the last uh, but of course not the least uh, elements are criticisms or critiques now no theory is universally applicable you know and so every theory has certain shortfalls no theory explains everything i mean you don't have any theory that explains everything you know so theories are only relevant to the extent that they're able to explain conveniently a particular phenomenon you know as much as possible and even in their own explanations there are certain places where they have lapses there are gaps in such theories or in the explanation you know that such theories provide and so you need other theories to help cover those gaps you know and so um, in some cases you need two or three theories to help make a complete argument all right so theories have criticisms theories have shortfalls that others have identified you know and upon those shortfalls other theories have been built you know to cover up for those lapses so these are these are some of the elements of a theory which i think we should bear in mind you know so whenever you hear of a theory um you should think about the assumptions you think about the concepts you know in that area of of study you should think about the proponents of such a theory and um, try to find out what are some of the criticisms or the shortfalls of the theory as the case may be now what are theories used for why are they or why are they useful we have said before that theories help us to explain reality you know they're very good tool for explaining certain circumstances phenomenon you know that's may have happened in the past or that are currently happening you know in the present theories also help to highlight the elements of a phenomenon that are relevant you know as we as we begin to look at some of the theories you will see that some specific aspects of the human of the human environment perhaps of the human nature you know are emphasized by some of these theories and so um, there's a, you know there, there are certain emphasis that theories make about um, some aspects of a phenomenon that are relevant um, for the conversation that is ongoing or for whatever um, situation you know circumstance such, such theories are used for theories also provide a framework for underst understanding or comprehending facts all right they provide a framework for comprehending facts theories summarize existing knowledge and provide guidelines for conducting research now it is difficult to conduct research without the use of theories the reason is because theories help us to contextualize our research you know we're able to find out what others have done in the past what arguments have been made in the past in line with the theories that you know or what what theories in the past have made arguments that are in line with the argument we are making in our research you know and so those theories help us to um to confirm the arguments we're making they help to give more validity you know to the arguments we're making so theories are very useful in research you know and of course they help to provide even new information into other areas that um, 
that that may not have been covered in in previous researches all right theories help us to explain to predict and to master phenomenon so these are some of the uses um, of theories theories can help us to predict what is likely to happen in the future you know because of certain circumstances that we have seen unfolding certain incidences that we have seen occur you know we are able to make predictions you know scientific guesses about what is likely to happen in the future and most times we might be not necessarily 100 percent correct but to a very large extent we might be correct you know especially because we are making predictions in social sciences and uh, the major element in social science is the human being which is not predictable you know the human being cannot be predicted so when you want to um, predict you know the human being you might not predict I mean you might not be able to predict completely um, but to a large extent your predictions might be near correct you know as much as possible now we'll go on to look at some of the theories of conflicts and peace you know um, that exist the first one we look at is the Marxist theory the Marxist theory is a theory that uh, is credited to Karl Marx you know as a major proponent of this theory and the theory basically argues that society is divided into classes right there are, there, are, there are several classes in society and two major classes that exist are the bourgeoisie class and the proletariat class or the the ruling class and the middle class you know if if that's that's another word for bourgeoisie you know can also be called the ruling class the proletariat can also be called the middle class all right so these two classes are two classes that are existing in every society all right now there's a relationship between these classes because um of course they exist in the same society they engage in the same kind of economic activities in the same political activities and so their a relationship exists among them and in the process of that of that interaction there seems to be a struggle you know among these classes the rich want to engage in activities that 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 help them to remain in that ruling class or the ruling class rather the elites want to engage in activities that make them remain elites make them remain in the ruling class um, but the middle class those in the middle class you know also want to be in the elite class you know and so there's a competition there's a struggle for resources a struggle for power you know among these classes and um, this competition results most times in conflict all right so we're saying that the competition that exists between the ruling class or the bourgeoisie class and the middle class or the proletariat class is one that is a potential for conflict and um, that that struggle or competition arises from the concern that certain individuals should not remain perpetually in a particular class you know um you, you should not have a society where people are perpetually in the middle class they cannot grow out of the middle class into the ruling class you know um and of course in many cases the argument also of of marxists of the marxist theory is that the ruling class do everything in their power to ensure that the ruling class remains small you know because of course one of the other arguments of marxism of marxism or the marxist theory is that the ruling class in society you know are made up of very few people so there are very few people who are in the ruling class or in the bourgeoisie class whereas the middle class or the proletariat are the majority of the society you know so that is that is also a very key consideration in the struggle you know um and the theory is saying or the argument in the theory is that some group of people should not remain perpetually in the ruling class whereas the majority of the population remains in the middle class all right um but of course the ruling class engage in activities sometimes exploitative activities that that keep them in the ruling class you know against all odds and prevent those in the middle class from reaching the ruling class so these are these are certain things that that motivate and sustain the 
the competition or the struggle that exists among these two classes in society. And of course, the argument is that every society has these two classes of individuals within them. The ruling class, which are very small in number, and the, the middle class or the proletariats, which are you know, very, very large. A majority of society fall under the middle class, and just a few people are in the ruling class. And this is a recipe for conflict, you know, because there's going to be that constant struggle um, among the members of these two classes. The second theory is the biological theory. Um, this theory is said to have to be drawn from the Hobbesian state of nature. You know, Thomas Hobbes argued that in the state of nature, individuals had a right to do whatever they wanted to do. There was no government, and so people were free to take laws into their hands and respond to situations in the best way that they saw fit. You know, and so nobody was accountable to anybody else. You know, that is the state of nature that Thomas Hobbes um, argued about. You know, and he said that man, the nature of man, um, is dictated by this state of nature. So man is always angry, is always, you know, um, is always self-interested, is always self-motivated, and will do everything to, to ensure that, that, you know, his own goals, his own objectives and needs are met. All right. Uh, so that 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 idea argues that the human nature is a selfish one. You know, the human nature is a selfish one. And so it assumes that uh, human nature, this nature, this selfish, self-centered, self-maximizing nature of man is transferred from generation to generation. So when people are born, you know, they are naturally um, self-interested. And that's why, you know, um, you find out that even in certain, certain conditions, in certain situations, you find out that people, okay, you find out, you find out that people are, um, you know, you find out that when children are born, they are, I mean, you, 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 you don't, you don't easily get things from them, from, from, from children, you know, they are, they are always quick to withhold whatever it is that they have, they don't want to share, you know, and things like that. Those are, those are some examples that are, that are given to, um, to lay or to provide some kind of, of justification for this biological theory. The fact that uh, the fact that children, as innocent as they may seem, also have this nature of withholding things to themselves, you know. Uh, so those are those are arguments that help to justify the biological theory. All right, that the human nature, the self-interested, self-maximizing nature of the individual, is transferred from generation to generation. Now, Sigmund Freud have also argued that there are two basic instincts in every man. There are two basic instincts. The first instinct is what is called the tonatos, you know, or the death, the death instinct. And the second instinct is the eros, the life or survival instinct. So these death and life instincts are two basic instincts that every human being has. All right. Now, the, the death instincts that are inward uh, are instincts that that result in self-destruction. People commit suicide. You know, people get to depression. Those are those are death instincts that that manifest on the inside. You know, or that take place on the inside. And of course, they result in some of these things that we see. People are depressed. People have suicidal thoughts. You know, those are those are inward manifestations of the death instinct. All right. Outward manifestations of, of the death instinct are people's fearlessness, people, people's um, willingness to to walk into their death. I mean, people's willingness to go to war, you know, to 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 be aggressive and pick up a fight that they know um, they might not necessarily they might not necessarily be be um, be victorious in. All right. So these these are two instincts that people that people. Um, have and or that manifest in, in individuals in terms of 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 death all right but the life instincts uh the life instincts of course manifest inwardly uh in terms of of survival people uh want to survive people want to you know people people want to um have 
uh, people have um, instincts where they where, where they just want to you know to to live and prosper basically in society you know and outwardly people are ambassadors of peace you know people are ambassadors of peace and so they they want to pursue peace at all costs and ensure that um, that they have um, the environment you know that they have environment that is conducive for them to pursue peace as much as possible okay so these are the two instincts that individuals possess and um, these two instincts are what also constitutes the the human nature you know according to the biological theory all right so um that is what the biological theory uh, argues all right we've talked about the uh the marxist theory and the competition that exists between the two classes we've talked about the biological theory and the nature of man you know the self-interested nature of man and how that nature manifests to the extent that it is transferred from generation to generation and not just that that nature also has two dominant instincts you know the death instinct and the life instinct and of course these two instincts um, um, argue for conflict you know the death instinct you know uh, tends more towards conflict whereas the life instinct tends more towards you know peace pursuing peace you know advocating for peace and so on and so forth all right the third theory is the psychosocial theory the psychosocial theory this theory basically assumes that the human brain is able to respond you know to aggression and peace equally you know of course the psychosocial theory uh, is one that talks about the psychology of man in relation to society you know how does how do individuals understand society how do they respond to their society, to the environment, basically, and so on and so forth. So, the assumption here is that um, individuals are able to respond, you know, equally to aggression as well as to peace. All right. So it assumes that um, people's environment teach them to be aggressive. People's environment also teach them to be peaceful. You know, individuals might might be peace-loving people naturally. You know. But of course, certain things can go on in the environment that that make them um, respond or react in certain violent, aggressive manner. Even though naturally they want to be peace-loving, they want to be um, peace, you know, peaceful people. All right. So the environment is a very, very key factor, um, according to the psychosocial theory, about how how whether or not conflict occurs, whether or not peace is sustained. All right, we must pay attention to what goes on in the environment and how do people respond, you know, to what goes on in the environment. Is the environment one that promotes peace or is the environment one that promotes conflict? All right, because the argument of the psychosocial theory is that conflict um, can be a product of one's environment. Peace can also be um, encouraged, promoted by the environment as well so both conflict and peace can be um, consequences of the human environment all right the next theory is the economic livelihood theory economic livelihood theory here uh, they said to be a link between politics and scarcity and politics in this sense refers to power you know political power how do you influence other people um, other people's decision you know in your favor basically and then resources you know how do you gain access to resources that's that's politics so there's a there's a link between politics and scarcity you know and that link is the fact that people would naturally engage in politics to ensure their economic safety you know to, en to ensure that they don't uh, that they're not thrown into scarcity so the reason why people engage in politics, engage in power, you know, engage in struggle for resources, is to prevent themselves from, from, um, from being victims of scarcity, you know, of the worst forms of scarcity. So of course, if everyone is, is engaging in politics for political or for, for is engaging in politics for economic end, 
it means that there's a competition that is going on in society you know where everyone is is competing for power you know is competing for resources just so that they can they can be economically secure you know just so that they can be economically secure and so the assumption here is that economic condition is can be a motivation for conflict economic condition so if people are poor then of course they will naturally um you know they would they will naturally be more competitive in terms of of competition for certain uh, better standards of living better life you know as the case may be so economic conditions encourage uh, economic conditions encourage violence encourage conflict you know um when people have access equal access to resources equal access to power you know when people are involved to a large extent in in the order of things then you find out that the propensity for conflict reduces you know but when you find out that people um are increasingly excluded you know from access to resources excluded from participation in decision making you know there's higher probability that conflict will occur all right so so these economic um conditions you know access to resources access to water access to to land you know and so on and so forth can often lead to conflict all right that is what the economic livelihood theory says you know and of course land and water are very very important life resources you know land and water are very important life resources and of course these resources are scarce you know these resources are scarce and so uh they have to be evenly or equally distributed people have to have equal access as much as possible to these resources you know in order to reduce the propensity for conflict in society all right we're also told that the economic conditions that result from um from competition you know for these resources is greed and grievance you know so if people if people are in constant competition you know they might become greedy they might i mean the competition makes people you know greedy or the fact that that they don't have sufficient access to resources you know can make them interested in profit all right from primary commodities so people naturally um are interested have an interest in profit they have an interest in profit and that's why they compete that's why they engage in politics so that they can have economic benefits you know that is the greed they're talking about all right and when they don't achieve those of those economic objectives they become rebellious there's there's grievance they are aggrieved and so they become rebellious and such rebellion can be manifested in several ways all right it can be manifested in several ways paul collier is one of the major theorists or proponents of this economic livelihood theory all right um you find out that in some of them i'm not giving you the proponents because i want you to do some work yourself okay so paul collier is the pro is a major proponent of the economic livelihood theory and of course he has argued a lot about how resources how scarce resources you know can can be a conflict motivator um frustration aggression theory is another theory of conflict frustration aggression theory this theory holds that aggression comes as a result of frustration you know and vice versa frustration comes as a result of aggression you know and frustration here in the sense that it is an event with observable conditions all right people get frustrated due to observable occurrences and not by a wave of abstract feeling you know or emotion so people are frustrated because of certain things that that happen you know either because they are not they are not they are not included in the process of making decisions increasingly they, are, they have been excluded or they have been continually denied certain resources that they are entitled to you know they become frustrated all right and of course when individuals are frustrated they naturally react um you know uh in in a very very violent you know sometimes conflictual manner and individuals will naturally react you know to unpleasant situations so so the response to frustration is necessarily you know most likely in many cases is aggression 
all right the response to frustration is aggression it says when people are prevented from reaching their goal they get frustrated such frustration can turn into anger you know if it's not if it's not addressed uh, immediately or effectively it can turn into anger and then of course when the anger lingers for a long time it can be triggered by anything and then aggression would occur so the, this theory basically says that unmet expectations unfulfilled dreams or goals in society frustrate people you know to the extent that they are angry and such anger you know can lead to aggression eventually if not properly managed the last theory we're going to discuss is the human needs theory all right human needs theory and this is slightly similar to frustration aggression theory the human needs theory uh, basically says that you know there are certain needs that human beings want you know or that human beings have you know basic needs food clothing shelter you know um of course self self actualization is the highest need of human beings human beings want to feel actualized they want to feel you know they want to achieve their their goals and potentials all right and so um in human interaction both at individual level and in group level um is in pursuit of these needs that they have all right and so the assumption here is that when these needs are unfulfilled um conflicts is likely to occur all right conflict, conflict is likely to occur um, but of course the difference between this and frustration is that it's conflict it might not go through all those all those stages of frustration aggression you know um, that is the argument of the frustration aggression theory that conflict goes through those stages uh, uh, before they occur you know when 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 people are faced with unpleasant situations you know obvious outcomes when there are obvious outcomes that are not satisfactory to people they go through being frustrated they go from being frustrated to getting angry and then aggression can come you know as a result of these two eventually all right but human needs um doesn't necessarily specify those levels of conflict those levels of escalation in the conflict process you know from frustration to aggression all right but the point here is that unmet needs too, unfulfilled needs, are a conflict motivation. And here the needs are more specific, not necessarily needs of resources or needs of uh, involvement in, in decision making. But here it is basically food, clothing, shelter, you know, and the need to actualize oneself, one's dreams. So those are, those are the needs that individuals have. And um, if they are deprived of these needs or they are not able to achieve these needs, then conflict might, might occur, all right? Abraham Maslow is one of the major proponents of the human needs uh, theory. He was the one who, um, who stated that human, human needs, you know, follow a hierarchical order, all right? From, from, the, f from the base, of course, there, there are basic needs that people want, food, needs for shelter, needs for clothing, you know, and as they go up the pyramid, people just want to be self-actualized, all right? And so when they don't actualize their dreams, you know, their aspirations, uh, they can become, um, they can become conflictual or that can lead to conflict, you know, in many cases. So these are theories that help to explain um, several conflict situations. All right. Now, all these theories um, might not or would not, would not, these theories provide various arguments about you know why conflicts occur how conflicts occur how to understand you know um the reason why conflicts have occurred or how to understand certain specific conflicts these six theories you know provide six explanations to conflict remember we have said that a theory you know is basically synonymous to sitting in a room that has several windows if you look out if you look out the room from a particular window you know you are bound to see a different section of the outside you know if you look from another window you are bound to see another entirely different section of the outside you know you cannot have uh, you cannot see completely all of the perspective outside except you go outside uh, you, so you cannot you cannot, conf you cannot you cannot conveniently um, 
you know have a complete view of the outside from inside you can only view from the window and the window is restricted so it gives you only what is able to show you you know from that um, from that window about the outside if, if you understand what, what I'm saying so that that is the same with theories theories are limited to the extent that they're able to explain only certain aspects of the phenomenon in question and in this context we're talking about conflict all right so the humanist theory only only talks about um, the needs of the individual as it relates to how that can motivate conflict you know the biological biological theory talks about how the genetic trans transfer of the human nature from generation to generation or the transfer rather not genetic now the transfer of the human nature self-interested you know from generation to generation is one um, of the of the factors that can motivate conflict the fact that individual nature is self-interested is self-maximizing you know uh, that is one of the of the of the factors that can motivate conflict you know and of course the instincts too that humans have death instincts life instincts that is the view of the biological theory there's a different view for the marxist theory there's a different view for the frustration aggression theory there's a different view for other theories all right so that is the the um is an important fact to note about theories theories no single theory explains everything all right they can only explain as much as the arguments um allow them to explain about the phenomenon and so that's why sometimes you need two or three theories to make you know um a very a very comprehensive argument about any phenomenon that it is in conclusion we have said that theories are important part of the search for explanation you know of certain phenomenon in this case we're trying to explain conflict and peace all right um why conflict occurs why peace occurs we have talked about psychosocial theory you know and how the environment can either promote peace or promote conflict all right so these uh these 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 theories help us to explain phenomenon we've talked about the four basic elements of a theory you know the assumption the concepts uh the proponents and the critique we've also said that um peace and conflict you know enjoys uh theories from other disciplines you know of course we have talked about the psychosocial uh the psycho the the psychosocial theory yeah in which is a theory from sociology you know there are there's also the marxist theory which is a theory from economics you know so many of these theories are theories from other social science disciplines which are relevant for us in explaining um in explaining conflicts you know uh in this in this particular case all right so theories of peace and conflict are not the same as the causes i think that is important to emphasize again all right even though theories provide explanation about some of the conditions that motivate that propel you know that that encourage conflict they are different from the types uh they're different from the causes of conflict all right the causes of conflict we have, we have talked about the fact that causes of conflict include communication you know include um um you know include the means of uh, the the resources that are available and so on and so forth so all of those are causes of conflict but these are theories that help to explain not just the causes but even beyond the causes you know of conflict the factors that motivate it you know how the conflict unfolds what what is the role of the human being you know in propelling the conflict what what other factors are involved in determining whether or not conflict conflict occurs and why all right so um theories are different from causes i think that is important for us to underscore uh, so that we don't we don't think that theories are, are the same as causes of conflict so even though theories help to explain the factors that motivate and that might lead to conflict they are not the same as the causes of conflict all right um but rather communication language you know um um i mean all of those constitute causes of conflict all right uh so that's where we're going to stop the presentation or end the presentation for today 
if you have questions or comments uh, you can please reach out uh, we can continue the conversation after here in the meantime thank you so much for listening